Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you celebrate in this season. Yeah. And then we want to move, we want to walk by faith into God. Amen. Hallelujah. Maybe you've been in a dry season. Amen. But by faith, we hear the sound of rain. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Maybe you've been down and out and maybe you've been depressed. Amen. People were quarantined in their house. Amen. But on this evening, amen, we declare, amen, that God, hallelujah, hallelujah, how our God reigns over these things. Amen. Amen. So we put the name of Jesus. We call on the power. That is in that name. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost power. Amen. That is in the name of Jesus. Amen. And we want to move and walk by faith. Amen. So I'm looking forward. Amen. To the Bible study on this evening. Amen. Amen. We're glad to be in the house of God. Amen. Yet again, and those of you out there on the live stream, we'd like to say welcome you. Amen. To the Agape Apostolic Church. Amen. Of deliverance. Hallelujah. We serve one Lord, one faith. Amen. One baptism. Amen. On a, on a Wednesday evening, amen, I say, and we say, T-G-I-W. Thank God it's Wednesday. It's that, amen, halfway point in the week. Some call it hump day. Amen. We just thank God it's Wednesday, amen, because, not because it's the halfway point through the week, amen, but we get to, amen, get together, amen, on a Wednesday evening, amen, and testify and hear about Amen. The goodness that is in the Lord. Amen. Amen. I hear the sound of rain in this dry season. Amen. Somebody said, I'm coming out. Amen. Hallelujah. Whatever it is, I'm coming out. I'm walking and I'm talking by faith. Amen. So I'm declaring and I'm, I'm proclaiming it before it happens. Amen. Because we put the name of Jesus over it. Amen. We put the name of Jesus over it. Amen. Hallelujah, I'm going to need some help on this evening, amen. I have a very tired voice, so I'm not going to overstate, but I'm just going to worship. Amen. If you're going to worship, you're going to worship with us, amen. Hallelujah. One, Thank you, Jesus, two. and that's not it. Amen. I don't know what that is, amen, but we're going to get out of that. Amen. And that is all right. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know what that is, amen. Praise the Lord. I, I feel my help coming. <laughs> Amen. This is the book has arrived. Amen. I don't know what that was. I'm going to try that again. Amen. Intro. Two. Three. We're going to stop that all together. Amen. And, and I don't have anything pressed on here. Amen. We're just going to move right ahead. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Amen. So the girl, I don't know how long you know this song, but you can help me anyways. Thank you. 
Because God is for us. Hallelujah. We bless his holy name. Somebody said, I surrender all. I surrender all. Hallelujah, Jesus. His presence is here. He is for us. He is for you. He is for you. Hallelujah. Surrounding us. Surrounding us. Hallelujah, Jesus. He knows how to keep. Amen. His children. Hallelujah, Jesus. We're about to pray. Thank you, Jesus. We're about to move before the throne of grace. I'm going to ask Brother Caraway if you will come up. Amen. And grab your microphone. Amen. To lead us in the word of prayer. Hallelujah. I'm just so glad that God is for me. Yes, that God is with me, that he's within me. He's all around me. He's guiding. Hallelujah. He's leading. He's protecting. He's keeping. Hallelujah. He's comforting. Yes, in your weeping, he is for you. In your rejoicing, he is for you. How many know he's in touch? With your weaknesses and your infirmities and your feelings. Yes, Lord God. I thank you that I serve that kind of God. And yes, God is real. For I can feel him in my soul. Amen. We're about to pray tonight. Amen. We have a few prayer requests that we just want to continue to call out. Amen. And we're gonna, this is Brother Fritz's mom, Deanna Pritchard. Amen. We're continuing to pray for her that God touches her body. Amen. Heals the tumor that is set in her liver. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to continue to pray. Amen. Hallelujah for Steve and Cora Weisenfelder. Amen. With the loss of their 27 year old son. Amen. So we want to continue to pray for Steve and, Steve and Cora and the rest of their family. Amen. Um, we want to continue to pray. Amen. For James Johnston has brain cancer and he's in hospice. So we want God to just touch his soul. Amen. If God wants to, he can save. We want God to have his way. Amen. And we want to continue to pray for Joanne Jacobs. Amen. For pancreatic cancer and she's on hospice. Amen. And hallelujah. Amen. We want to uh, thank you. Um, we want to pray for um, Sister Petra and family. Amen. For bereavement. Her brother passed away. What did you say? When? Last week, her brother passed away. Amen. So we want to pray for Sister Petra as well. Amen. Any other unspoken prayer requests? Can we acknowledge by raising our hands? Amen. We thank God because He is for us. Amen. We're trusting and believing. Amen. That God, amen, can fix it and will fix it. Amen. We proclaim tonight by faith. Amen. I don't know what we've been going through and thinking about before, but on this evening, amen, we're crying out, amen, to God by faith. Amen. Believing, amen, that He's going to deliver. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He is for us. He is with us. He is before us. He's behind us. He's all around us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. If we can just bow our heads, those of us that are looking on the live stream and those of us that are here, close your eyes and meditate on the name of Jesus. The church needs help today. The church of God needs help today. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you. Thank you, O oh Lord, for your kindness and your keeping. Thank you, Lord God, for your patience and your forbearance. Thank you because you know us inside and out. You know the end from the beginning. Lord, and you knew what state of mind we would be in right now, but yet, knowing our condition, still you went, not just to the cross, 
but you lived an entire life for the sake of salvaging your people. Not only did you bear the stripes, not only did you tolerate the mockery, but Lord, you knew where we would be right now, and yet you loved us. You could have come down off the cross. You could have called your angels when they were smiting you on the cheek. But with every blow and with every lash of the whip, one of our faces came before you. And you said, I will stay here for them. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you. Lord God, in Jesus' name, because of your great love that you've shown and how you continue to keep, continue to deliver, continue to make ways, continue to heal. Lord, we're facing a great darkness. Lord, evil is all around us, but the light of the Lord is within us. And the light shines brighter than any darkness can shine. Lord, we thank you for the spirit of time that we're in. Lord, because we will see your glory for ourselves. When we reflect on the word of God and the miracles that happen, we will see those miracles happen again. We will see the dead raising and blind seeing the deaf hear and the new talk. We will see salvation happen in a grand way. Lord, we're grateful. Thank you for keeping us through this period of COVID. Thank you. Yes. For keeping our minds, oh Lord, keeping us from depression, keeping us from suicide, keeping us from giving up, giving in, giving out, throwing in the towel and walking away. Thank you. Lord, you did not allow the virus to affect anyone in our midst. Truly a thousand will fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but you didn't let it come out of our dwelling. Thank you. You kept us saved and unsaved alike. Lord, you kept our unsaved relatives because we placed them on the cross and said, Lord, have mercy. And you had mercy. Thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Lord, speak to us. Wake up your church. Wake up your people. Lord, don't let us stay asleep and be overtaken by the adversary. Lord, wake us up. Shake us, break us, whatever you've got to do. But Lord, help us to be saved in this time. Father, we're praying, oh God, that you make us to stand. And have you don't want to stand, let us stand, oh God, and be true soldiers in the army of the Lord, fighting a good fight of faith and laying hold into eternal life. Lord, we pray, oh God, that you resurrect our souls within us. And let us stand, oh God, proclaiming the name of Jesus. Walking forward, not looking backward, but gaining our path as we go. Because you don't have any coward soldiers in the army of the Lord. Father, we pray right now, infuse us with your power. Give us your mind. Help us to have your courage. Help us to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. My God, Praise up an army unto you. Let us praise your name, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Have your way in our lives. Help us to submit and say, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, help us to cast down every imagination of false security and help us to be pleasing in your sight. Father, give us a, a, a divine inspection in our minds, our hearts, our souls. Help us, oh God, to give up to you and that you have your way. Yes. Lord, we pray that you bless every prayer request that was mentioned. Yes. Meet their needs according to your riches and glory. Yes. Save souls, O oh Lord. We pray, O oh God, that you raise them off their sick bed. Give them a mind to give you thanks. Oh. Father, heal their bodies as you see fit, but save their souls. You, Lord. Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, O oh God, that you bless the man of God abundantly this evening. Let him speak into our souls your words. Speak to us through him. Anoint the message. Anoint the messenger. Lord, we pray that you will feed our souls. 
We surrender ourselves unto you when we say, have your way in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Most of all, we thank God that in this day and age we live in and we still have a mind to serve God. Do I have any people that are ready to serve God? Amen. Amen. Do we have a high water that we ought to serve the Lord? Amen. We thank God for those that are joining us via live stream. And the most important thing is we thank God for the word of God. The Bible says his words are left to our feet and a light to our path. Can we say hallelujah? Amen. Without the word of God, we will be like a ship without a sail. We'd be tossed to and fro. But tonight we just thank God for his goodness and mercy. We're going to ask you to stand for our scripture reading. We're going to read reading from Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 6. Amen. It's a continuation from our message on Sunday. Acts, the ninth chapter, verses 1 through 6. How, how many know we serve a faithful God? Amen. I, I believe God never lets us down. Amen. Amen. He's always with us, He's a keeper. Our God is a way maker. Amen. He's that and everything else. So tonight we thank God. Amen. So we're going to start reading in the first verse of this ninth chapter. And the first verse reads, And Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus to the synagogue. That if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And sometimes we need a sudden experience, suddenly experience, amen? amen. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth. And heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecuted thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecuted. It is hard for thee to kick against the prince. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? What can he say? What? Lord, what? Would I have you to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading of his word. And the church said, Already, may you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Uh, and I want to read uh, another uh, text of scripture before we get into this from Mark, the seventh chapter. We're going to read verses 6 through 13. But the most important thing that we have is the what? Word of God. The Word of God is what we receive our instructions in righteousness, our instructions in holiness. But we're living in a day and a time where people are taking the Word of God and making it say what they want it to say. Amen. They're twisting scripture to our traditions and neglect the Word of God. Can we say praise the Lord? Amen. So he said, For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curses father or mother, let him die the death. But he said, If a man shall say to his father or mother, It is Corban, that is to say, a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by man, he shall be free. And ye suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother. Making the word of God a what? Not a fact. So when we hold on to our traditions and what we think, we make the word of God a not a fact to what? Your traditions which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. Amen. We, so tonight, what we're, we're going to do, what we're endeavoring to do, is we want the word of God to be alive in our lives. Amen. And Deacon George, can you turn the air conditioner on? Everybody's standing and sweating. Amen. I don't know if he can hear me. Somebody might have to help him out a little bit. Amen. Amen. So we, we we want God to be first in our lives. So one of the things that I know I, I read uh, from Bishop G.T. Haywood, they said Bishop G.T. Haywood was such a lover of the Word of God. He had all of his ministers read through the Bible seven times a year. 
Seven times a year. You know why? Because it's the word of God that keeps us. Amen? It's the word of God that gives us our, our, our marching order. Can you imagine seven times a year? It wasn't an option. He said, if you're going to be a minister in this, in this church, under his leadership, you have to read the Bible seven times a year. Why? Because the Bible is that important. Amen? So what, we, what we're going to do tonight, as we said, the first verse, they were following, they, he was, Paul was persecuting the disciples of who? The Lord. Not the disciples of Jesus. So Paul, so Luke is setting a narrative at that time. And the narrative was who the Lord is. So that's what he was establishing. Amen? So let's just go to our notes uh, from this point forward. And I, I have a lot of notes. And I, I thought it's important to realize when Paul was going to Damascus, he was going to get all those that were back, he was going to go back. All of those that were calling on Jesus, he was looking for them in what? A synagogue. Amen. Synagogue. So many times, especially today in our society, when we look at synagogues, we think Jewish. Amen. We think Jewish. Well, when Paul was going to the synagogue, he was going after those that were following the way. And the way is who? Jesus. Right? So, obviously, the Jews at that time and the Christians were worshiping together because they were in synagogues. Amen? Amen? Uh, uh, amen. This is time. Can you just sing the song for one second? Just sing a congregational song. Give me one second. Any congregational song? Amen. I just I just have to fix some of our technical difficulties. Excuse me. I, I don't know if we're on anyway.
two, we, we do thank God. I don't know, we, I know we have some technical challenges. We've dealt with spectrum. I don't really know what the issue is, but we pray that, that, uh, that the live stream did come and go on. Uh, but nevertheless, let's go to our notes. Uh, we're going to just read, as I said, now what, uh, what a lot of people don't realize in, 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 the, in the beginning church, the Jew and the Christians were worshiping in the same facility. That's why when Paul was going to Damascus, he was going to get those in the synagogue. All right, so let's go to our notes, amen. I want to stop for a moment to present some food for thought. It's extremely important for us to understand and to do a proper and correct exegesis, which is a proper interpretation of scriptures. Exegesis is drawing out text meaning in accordance with the author's context and discoverable meaning. The eisegesis is what man does according to their own personal interpretation. All right. Thus, exegesis tends to be objective, and eisegesis is highly subjective, meaning it's according to the teaching of man. It is extremely important that we understand the difference between the two as we continue to break down the scriptures. I want to say it another way. Exegesis is exactly what God says, and eisegesis Jesus is what how men personally interpret what God says. And we know what Peter says in 2 Peter 2, 2 Peter verse 1, verses 16 through 21. He said, For we have not followed common, commonly devised fables, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And Peter's referencing when he, Peter, and John, when Peter, James, and John were all, not Peter, James, and John, Peter, yeah, Peter, James, and John, when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, that's what he's making reference to. He said, for he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard. We were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Whereunto you do will that you take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your heart. Knowing this first, that what? No prophecy of the scriptures of. Well, what is happening today is people are taking God's word and personally interpreting what is said. That is eisegesis, amen. The correct interpretation should be the exegesis. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but what? Holy man of God spake, and they were moved by the Holy Ghost. I mention all this to show how the translators use their personal interpretation of scripture to express what they thought and did interpret what the scripture states. For example, Acts 9 to read, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the what? Synagogue. That if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Is this verse saying that the first century church was still worshiping God in the synagogues? The answer is yes. The synagogue provided a ready platform for the teaching of Jesus, who read, who ready taught and healed in synagogue. So in Jesus' ministry, he was always in the synagogue. He taught in the synagogue. He healed in the synagogue. Amen? The synagogue proved to be a significant part of God preparing exactly the right cultural practices for his for Jesus' ministry. But more than that, Jesus' disciples and Paul, as well as most of the early Jewish followers of Jesus, went to the synagogue to worship. Right? So I'm, what I'm trying to show you, we're going to establish something because what the translators have done is they've taken and made the synagogue apply to the Jews, and they made the church apply to the Christians. But we're going to show you how through the scripture, because the church, this is, what is the Greek word for a church? Ecclesia, right? That means to call that once. Well, 
we're going to show you through the scripture. The ecclesia existed 250, almost 300 years before the church was even born. So the ecclesia had to have another meaning other than the church. Because we are showing through the scripture how ecclesia wasn't just for the church. The original ecclesia was for the Israelites. Right? But because of the, of the prejudice of the translators, they took and made the ecclesia apply to the church. For instance, I, it always bothered me, and when you read in Acts, the seventh chapter, when when uh, Stephen is preaching, and he says, he talks about Moses in the church in the wilderness. Right? Moses in the church in the wilderness. Well, what he uses is the Greek word ecclesia. But I'm gonna, we're going to show you through the scripture how ecclesia was used for the Jews assembling 300 years before Jesus was even born. So how did the word ecclesia just get come pertaining to the Christian church? How did that happen? Where did that happen? All right? So that's just a little teaser for where we're headed. Amen? The synagogue provided a ready platform. Well, we did already. More than that, Jesus said, all right, the synagogue was not simply a place to share God's word, but also an important part of the Jewish people's relationship to God. It might surprise modern Christians to discover that many church practices are based on the synagogue customs that Jesus followed. Understanding the synagogue and its place in Jesus' life and the teaching is an important step in hearing his message in the cultural context in which God placed it. Let's dissect the meaning behind the Greek word for synagogue, which is synagogue. And synagogue means, listen, an assembly, a bringing together, hence a synagogue. Synagogue or an assembly is also the Greek word ecclesia, which means a gathering of citizens called out from their home into some public place, an assembly, an assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. Remember initially when Moses, when he erected the tabernacle? This is where the call out came from. In order for them to be with God, he had to call them out of their houses to the what? Tabernacle. That's where the ecclesia first started. And we know that everything that happened in the Old Testament was types and shadows of Christ and the church. So, when he called them out, they never worshiped. So uh, it, when we went over to when we were in the uh, early in Genesis, that when they set up the tabernacle, it's amazing how God ordained it so that all of the tribes were set up in the order so they formed a cross. When the tribes were set up, they formed a cross with the tabernacle. You remember? I don't know if you all remember that in our earlier teaching. Amen. So what God did is he called them out of their homes to the tabernacle. That was the ecclesia. That was the calling out. They did what? They assembled. So keep that in mind. Amen. Synagogue or an assembly is also the Greek word ecclesia, which means a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place and assembly. An assembly of Christians gathered for worship in a religious meeting. Assembly has its origins in the Old Testament. The first time it is used is in Exodus, the 12th chapter, and the 6th verse. Now I know we're supposed to be doing our message is supposed to be Lord, right? We're supposed to be, our message is supposed to be what? Lord, what do you want me to do? But what I'm saying is in order for us to know what the Lord wants us to do, we need to understand what was happening and how it was happening. Amen. We like to just jump right to messages and we skip over because of what we've been taught through tradition. Amen. So it's so important that we don't just live by tradition, but we need to live by the word of God. So Exodus 12, 6, he said, And ye shall keep it until the 14th day of the month, and the whole assembly. Now, the, the Hebrew word for assembly is kehel, means assembly, congregation, an organized body of religious for religious purposes. That's the same thing that we get for the word synagogue. All right? For religious purpose, called out people who assembled together. So they did of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. The topic becomes more interesting when we look at how these words were translated into Greek in the Septuagint. 
Have you all read the Septuagint and trust? What is the Septuagint? Or what is the, you ever see the LXX? Right. We got, in the Septuagint, well, let me just read it. We'll, we'll do it here. Let me shed some light on the Septuagint before we continue. Around 250 BC, Ptolemy II asked Eliezer the high priest to translate the Hebrew text of the Law of Moses, which was the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, into Greek, in order to provide the library of Alexander with a Greek translation of the Hebrew Law. So the Septuagint, they, 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 what they did is they translated from the Hebrew to the Greek. This was 250 years before Jesus was even born. Almost 300 years before the church was established. So keep that in mind. Amen? In the Septuagint, Kehel is sometimes translated from Hebrew into Greek as synagogue. But other times it is translated as ecclesia. These words, when later used in the New Testament, have been translated into English as synagogue and church. Matthew records Jesus using church in Matthew 16 and 18. And we all are familiar with this. I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church. But Jesus did not speak Greek. Amen. Jesus didn't speak Greek. So Jesus would not have said Ecclesia. Amen. He would not have said that. So Jesus would have used the word to hell. It said, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. In Matthew 18, 17, he said, and it shall be, be and if he shall neglect to hear thee, tell it to the king hell. Now we know they shall have ecclesia in Greek. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee an heathen and a man and a publican. After the inauguration of the church, the usage, synagogue and church came to mean distinct separate groups of people. But prior to the inauguration of the church, the ecclesia had to do with Jews that gathered or assembled together for worship. So who changed it? How, how did it change and when did it change? When did it change to mean the church? For 300 years prior to the church, it meant the assembly of believers, those that were called out together. All right, so what changed it? How did it change it? The tradition of men. Amen. Because of the mindset of was of such that the writers or the translators tried to separate the Hebrews or the Jew Israelites from the Christian worshipers. And we'll go a little further to show that. Amen. You know, like I said, the church replaced Israel. And, and, and that's an interesting thought. Because if the church replaced Israel, and Paul says that the Gentiles were grafted into the tree then they should have had a new tree. But the Gentiles were grafted into the Israelite tree. All right, so keep that in mind as we go forward. Somebody say, you got a whole lot of stuff we do. All right, so let's keep on. The words are frequently used together to talk about the same people. In some places, they seem to be, seem to be used synonymous, synonymously. The question that naturally arises is, when were the current meanings added to these words? When did they come to mean something different? Synagogue as a gathering of Jews and church as a gathering of Christians. Which meaning did the writers of the New Testament have in mind when they use these words? Below are some Old Testament texts that use these words. All right, so we're gonna skip, let's just skip this. You guys can read that. Let's get down to some of our, some of the Old Testament texts. Now I wanna, um, if, we, if you go to the point where it says, well, Kehel is a strong number, uh, 86951, and it's in yellow. Eda is the strong, 5712 is in green. Ecclesia, and this is going to be in the Old Testament, is the RNG, 11577, and synagogue is G44 is going to be in blue. All right, so let's go to Exodus 12, 6 first. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month and the whole assembly. So what's that? That is Kehel, all right? The whole assembly 
the congregation which is the Eden. So these are all examples. I just want to skip down to the last two just for the sake of time. Let's go to uh, Numbers. Actually, let's go to 2 Chronicles uh, chapter 1, verse 3. You all can read all those others in between. I'm just going to show you how in the Old Testament they used Ecclesia in regards to the assembly. And that it's not the church that was those that were assembling as Israelites. Amen. So 2 Chronicles 1 3 says, So Solomon and all the congregation, and the congregation is the Kilel or the Ecclesia, with him went to the high, high place that was a Gideon, for there was the tabernacle of the congregation of God, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, had made in the wilderness. And Proverbs 5 14 says, I was almost in all evil in the midst of the Kilel or Ecclesia. So this is what? The Old Testament. This is prior to the church. So when did it change? Now how did it change? Amen? So we must ask ourselves, why did the translators intentionally corrupt the scripture? What was their thinking behind it? Let's compare a couple of other scriptures before we answer that question. Let's turn to Acts, the seventh chapter, and verse 37 through 38. Verse 37 reads, This is that Moses, which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, and him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the, in the Ecclesia. What was, what was Moses at? In the New Testament or Old Testament? The Old Testament. In the Ecclesia. It was, should be assembly or congregation and could be synagogue, all right? In the wilderness. So why would the translators insert church when Moses was not in the church when he was in the Ecclesia in the Old Testament? Because of their presence. Because of their desire to separate between the Israelites and the church. Amen? There is a deliberate anti-Semitic agenda when the translators interpret New Testament scriptures. We know reading Galatians 6, 11 through 16, that the church is what? The what? Israel of God. Amen. And this is uh, Galatians 6, 11 reads, You see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. They constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. But neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that ye may glory, they, they may glory in your flesh. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. For in Christ, in who? Christ. Jesus neither circumcision to build us anything, nor uncircumcision, but a what? If any man be in Christ, he is a what? You creature. All things have passed away, and all things have passed away. So as many as walk according to this rule, peace be unto them, and mercy and upon the Israel of God. I want to explain this so that we can try to study the Word of God without accepting the anti-Semitic agenda that the church has replaced Israel. The church hasn't replaced Israel, but has been grafted in into the olive tree. If we compare in Romans 11, 13 through 25, it reads, For I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I was the apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, and may save some of them. For if the casting away, now listen, if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? For if the first fruit be holy, the law is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. Remember Jesus said, I am the vine and ye are the branches. Except you abide in me, he said, you can't do nothing. For without me, you can do nothing. So we still make a reference to the branches and the vine. And if some of the branches be broken off, if what? Some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, 
were left in among them. That does not seem like a separation. You say you're being left in what? Among them and with them, partakers of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. So God did not replace the tree, but he, he, he grafted the Gentiles into the tree. Right? Into the olive tree. Amen? Amen. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of my belief, they were broken off. And thou standest by faith. He said, now be not high-minded, but what? Fear. For if God spared not the the natural branches, take ye, lest he also spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God unto them which fail severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in their unbelief, shall be so he said, they shall be grafted in. What? We're talking about what? One tree. Amen? For God is able to grab them in again. If they, so they were unbelieved, but if they believe, he grabbed them in. So who's in the tree? The Israelites and the Christians. Right? Because we are grafted in to the, to the olive tree. For thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good olive tree. So we're going into the what? The same tree. The same tree that the Israelites were cut off of, we're being, the branches were cut off of, we're being grafted into the what? The same olive tree. How much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? So God did not separate the trees. He said, we're being grafted into the tree. Now, if they become believers, they come back into the tree. Amen. So where did this great separation come from? The synagogue is for the Jews. The church is for the Christians. When in the beginning, Ecclesia meant the synagogue of the assembly of the Jews. Where did this all come from? Where did it change? The traditions and teaching of men. So it's important that we study the word of God. It's important that we don't just take everything at face value because at face value, we say, well, Jesus the, ch the church replaced the, ch the Israelites. Well, remember Jesus, Jesus said, I did not, in, in the Matthew, the fifth chapter, he said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to what? Fulfill it. And if you cross that and fulfill it, it means he came to uphold it. So he did not come to destroy the law, but he came to uphold the law. Amen. Many times in Paul's teaching, if you read Paul, Paul uses a lot especially in Hebrews, he uses a lot of the symbolism and type from the law. And he ties them into Jesus. Right? When he said, he talks about the tabernacle, but he says Jesus is a what? True tabernacle. So he uses many of the comparisons that are in the law to bring about a chain or a revelation for who Jesus is. Amen? Read it. So a lot of times when Paul is doing that, he's saying that he doesn't follow the law. That is not what Paul did. He used the law to draw a comparison. But Jesus himself did not come to destroy the law, but to what? Fulfill the law. Amen? For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceit. That blindness in part has happened to who? Israel until the fullness of the Gentile be come in. Now let's go to Galatians the third chapter. I'm not going to get to all of this. And verse 6 reads, now listen, we are all one and who? Abraham. Was Abraham a Christian? In Abraham to all nations of the earth in thy seas and all nations of the earth be what? Blessed. Was Abraham a Christian? Was Abraham in the church? So how can we bless in faith, be blessed in faith with Abraham? If there's a separation or distinction, amen? So Galatians 3, 6, 3, even as Abraham did what? Believe God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are? Was Abraham 
in the church. No. So if Abraham wasn't in the church, how can we be the children of Abraham? Amen. When Abraham was a Hebrew. So how can we do it? It's by faith. Amen. Abraham lived by faith. Romans, the fourth chapter, talks about the faith of Abraham. But we're in Abraham. Remember, even Jesus, when he was dealing with the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees, he said, do, do not think to say you have Abraham as your father. Right? When he was dealing with them. Amen. And they said, well, he said, you all together in sin. He said, well, we, we never were servants of sin. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, he says, I am. So what I'm saying is this. When it comes to studying the word of God, we cannot study the word of God based on the prejudices, based on the tradition that we've been taught. Because we, we completely separate. And, 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 and a lot, of, I was studying a, a lot, of, especially the Messianic Jews, they were like, everything in the church is a type of what happened in Israel. So why is the church saying that God replaced Israel? And they're Christians now, they're saying. Because the culture, it's important that we understand culture to understand God. Amen? Amen. Let's keep going. It says, the scripture for saying that God would justify the heathen through what? Faith. Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and thee shall all nations, but how can we be blessed when Abraham wasn't in the church? By faith. By if Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. But if they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now skip down to verse 14. That the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Faith. Said, brethren, I speak after the man of man, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man, this you cannot make the covenant God void. The same promise, the same covenant that God established, he said, you cannot make that void, and you can't add there, there too. Now to Abraham and his what? See where the promise is made. He says, not and to see as a many, but as a one, and to that see which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of not effect. And I just want to go through these last couple of verses here. Uh, Let's, let me go through these last couple of verses, if you all mind. I know I'm over time, but let me do this. So Matthew 5, 17 reads, Think not that I have come to what? Jesus said, I did not come to destroy the law, but I came to do what? To fulfill it. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one John or one till shall not in no wise pass and what? The what? Law until all be fulfilled. Right? So we, we take, talk today that the law, the things of the law has nothing to do with the church today. Well, one of the commandments part of the law, don't we keep the commandments? Amen. So there is no separation. That Listen, we know that you have to be baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. We do know that's true. Right? But we did not replace Israel. Uh, most uh, Paul asked the question, he said, has God cast off his people forever? He said, what? God forbid. Amen. So we did not replace. The only thing is because we have the faith of Abraham, we were grafted in as a wild olive branch. But God's covenant is still with his people. Uh, if, can you pull up uh, Jeremiah 32? Let me see. I, I got to look at my question. Jeremiah 32 chapter. Let me, let's go over this. For those that said that we have replaced Israel, you know, I've been, I've been studying this for a while. I said, hmm, it's kind of interesting that that we replaced Israel when the Bible said we were engrafted into the same tree that Israel was in. Amen? 
But let me read in, in the 32nd chapter of Jeremiah. Let me just read this quickly. I guess it's kind of fun. Give me one quick second, please. Uh, I think it's the 32nd chapter. Hold on. This is not the covenant. He, he, when he tells me that the only way I'm going to break my covenant is Israel if you can break the covenant of day and night. Do you all see that in anywhere? Great stretch out of my God. Hold on oh, no, one quick second. I thought it was in the 32nd chapter. Uh, and therefore, God. Uh, I don't see it, but I'll find it long enough the next week. It's probably in there. I'm probably just a little more. That teaches base bell. Well, he says concerning his covenant with Israel, he said the only way that in my covenant with Israel will be broken is if you can break the covenant between night and day. He said that's the only way my covenant will be broken with Israel. So if his covenant can never be broken with Israel, how did the church replace Israel? It's when many of the Israelites are believing Christians. Yeah. Amen. Those are the things we have to really consider. So we, I, I'll try to find that for you. Next week, all right. He said, The only way I will ever break my covenant with Israel, you know, and that's why the only ones that of us that can call him Lord are those that have a covenant relationship with God. So that makes him our Lord, our Yahweh, our Jehovah. If you don't have a covenant relationship with him, then you only know him as Elohim as a creator, you don't know him as your Lord, amen. Yeah. Yeah. 
Can we say praise the Lord? So that next week we will get into the real good stuff. <laughs> so next week we'll get over why Paul was so astonished when Jesus said, I am, when the, he said, who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus. Right? I, we, I got a whole lot on that. But I, I just wanted to bring out this because it's important when we, we study God's word, we can't study with the prejudices that we've been taught, the things that we've been instilled. We can't approach God's word like that. So we have to study the word of God. Now, don't study people, but people give you all kind of stuff. Right? Break down the scriptures. Break down the word of God. Right? Look, the Septuagint was, like I said, they did that 250 years prior to the church. And their purpose was because they wanted to, they actually eventually they converted the whole Old Testament into Greek. The whole Old Testament was converted into Greek. But when you go back to, when, so when you're studying the scripture, they said the Septuagint or the LXX, they're telling you that those words were used 250 to 300 years prior to the church of Jesus. So when we see those words, and we say those words only apply to the church, how can the ecclesia apply to the church as the assembly of the called out ones when it existed 300 years before the church was even born? Right? And yeah, I know I, 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 it's not a popular teaching, but I don't teach by popularity, I just teach by truth. So if the Ecclesia was used 250 to 300 years for the assembly of, of the Jews, or the, them being called out to worship, how did the New Testament make the Ecclesia the church and make the synagogue for the Jews? Right? Because of prejudices. Right? So when we approach the Word of God, we have to approach it openly. And you have to study that's why the script Paul says, study to show yourself what? Approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, doing what? Right. If there's a rightly divide, guess what? There's a wrong divide. Right? And see, I, I don't have all the answers, and I don't know it all, but I do know this. Right? If God uses some terms for the Israelites and the Jews 300 years before the church, and I know the Ecclesia don't, the Ecclesia don't just apply to the church. So how was Moses the church in the wilderness? Because they knew it was the Ecclesia. So what did they do? Instead of putting down what it should be as the synagogue or the assembly, they changed it to the church. Amen? So I just said, I thought, like I said, this is food for thought, right? Because when we study God's word, we can't study it based on the translators. You know, and I, and I actually tried, it's kind of hard, though. I did go back to read some of the Septuagint, Septuagint. They have their own Bibles where they converted everything to, from Hebrew to Greek. So I went back to it, but I don't understand Greek or Hebrew. Yes. <laughs> right? So it was hard, but I can see those words in English. You know, so they had the Hebrew, English, and then they had it in Greek. 300 years before the church. So that's when you study. Words that were used before the church can't apply just to the church. Amen. Words that were used 250 to 300 years before the church cannot just apply to the church. That's why we have to do our own study. Amen. Lazy Christians will believe whatever they're told. But we ought to search the scriptures. Even Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. He said, they are they which testify of me. Can we all just say hallelujah? Amen. Amen. Now before, I, what we're going to try to do is, uh, for those on live stream that do want to ask questions, if they call, not tonight, <laughs> but in the future, if they call the church number 518-274-3020, uh, I'll have my wife read your questions. We don't have to use your name. And we will try to answer them. And as always, if we can't answer them that week, I try to do as much research as I can to answer them the following week. Amen. So starting with the help of the Lord next week, we'll do that. But for those that are here tonight, do we have any questions or comments? I know somebody said, you just give us, you just gave us a shell shock. Right? But what I'm, I'm not trying to give us a shell shock, but I'm trying to say it's all the traditions. As Jesus said, you hold to your traditions and you make the word of God a what? Not a fact. 
So it's important that we study God's word for ourselves. Amen. And not just take, and don't read a bunch of com commentators. Right? You have to break the words down and study them. Amen? Amen. So if we have no comments, no questions, let us stand at this time. And we do bless the Lord. Amen. We thank God that uh, the churches are now opening. Amen. And uh, we're, we're praying for God's wisdom. We're praying for the mind of God that, that as churches are opening, we do it according to the mind of God. Amen? It's so important that we want to do what is pleasing to the Lord. And do we have anyone that have any prayer requests? Anything that we want God to do for you? Just wave your hand if you're on a live stream. If you want to wave your hand and touch the screen, God knows what things we have need of before we ask. And we, as, as a Christian and body of believers, we really need to pray for some of our this law decisions that are trying to be made. They're trying to pass this bill H6666. <laughs> we already know that has nothing but devil written all over it. I, I think that, Sister Brooke, is that the one for the mandatory vaccinations all over? I forget which one that is. I know that was in the they debate that in Congress and the Senate bill HR 666. When the Christians see that, we automatically know that's what? Evil. Yeah. Amen. And they're trying across this nation to force uh, mandatory vaccination. Actually, I shared an article from, uh, from Virginia about them talking about making it mandatory that every child has to be vaccinated with the COVID virus. Uh, COVID vaccination before they could go back to school. And they, some other people raised questions. And you know what one of them said? They said, we can, we, it's all right to lose a few kids for the better good. What do you mean? What do you mean it's okay to lose kids? They already predicted that kids are going to die from this COVID vaccination. You know? So we just have a lot as Christians to pray for. We know these are the last evil days. But how I many know we do trust and believe God? So let us pray. Heavenly Father, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, first of all, we thank you for your mercy, your goodness, and kindness. O oh God, we thank you that we still have a mind to seek and to serve the Lord in the land of the living. O oh God, we ask you to continue to order our steps, for we realize that the steps of a, of a good man are ordered by the Lord. So, Lord, we say order our steps, and we ask you to order our steps through your word. Lord, we ask you to bless us as a church worldwide to become more unified. Lord, bless us as a church worldwide to pray one for another, to lift each other up in prayer. Lord, the walls of division that have divided us for years, Lord, we ask you to tear down those walls. Lord, help us to come together on the same common ground. Lord, we don't have to believe exactly the same because but we know there's only one God. So, Lord, help us to act in the course of the one God. Lord, we thank you for Mother Carmen and our blessed continual progress. Lord, we ask you to continue to touch her. Oh, God, we ask you to continue to strengthen her. Oh, God, now we pray for the leaders across our country, the president and all those. Lord, those are first responders. Lord, those in the law enforcement. Lord, we ask you to bless. Oh, God, we ask you to intervene. Oh, God, we ask you in the name of Jesus to make things so that they can be well with our people. For you said authorities are there for the good. That the authorities that are ordained are ordained by God so that we can live a godly and a peaceable life. And Lord, we just ask you to have your way. Oh God, we continue to lift up the families that are struggling financially, oh God, across this nation and across the world. Lord, we lift up all those families that have been infected and afflicted by by the COVID virus, oh God, those that are still fighting recovery, those that have been bereaved, we lift them up even now. And Lord, we ask you as a church of God, bless us. Lord, unify us, help us to mind the same thing, to say the same thing, and to see, think the same way. And Lord, as we prepare to leave this place, but never thy presence, we ask you to go with us. And Lord, we ask you to touch the heart of every person that desires change. Lord, those that desire understanding, bless them. Oh God, we ask you for a spirit of unity. And for this we thank you. Can we all say in Jesus' name? Amen. Amen. And God bless you all. Hallelujah.